Mas bem, bem, bem. Vamos em cima da mesa. Penso que serão. How much is it? It's round. 10k. Acho que é 10 mil cada, cada ronda. Podem fazer rivais, que estão aqui ao lado. O Elki já está a fazer hora. E continuamos aqui todos à espera. Como se nada fosse. Uh, it was 2014, I was living in Vancouver, late in my day. Uh, he decided to sit down at the 300-600 PLO table with me. Looking back, I played pretty poorly. He, he really dominated me. Pot after pot went his way. I just ended up in so many big pots where I called a three bet, called a C bet, and folded the turn. And those added up fast. When all was said and done, I lost 1.1 million that day. I don't think anybody has ever won as much money online as fast as Victor has, but he also could lose it pretty quickly. Back in the day, there were maybe 20, 25 regulars who played 200, 400 plus online. And so when somebody new showed up that nobody had heard of and nobody had even seen at 5,100 or 100, 200, obviously everybody talked about it and tried to figure out who is this person and how good are they? The first time I heard about the legend that turned out to be Isildur 1, it was just some kid on Euro sites that I didn't play who apparently had climbed the ranks really quickly and was just battling at the highest stakes against the best players out of nowhere. Then Isildur 1 showed up on full tilt playing the highest stakes. And that's when all the other players who knew each other started talking. He's playing very aggressive. He wants to play deep. He's forcing you to make very big decisions all the time. and. Uh... And he's very talented, I think, uh, from the day one we played. You know, we would see him play against other people and play an aggressive style that we hadn't really seen before. It just seemed like there was a big pot again and again and again, uh, much more often than you normally see in these matches. And I had a couple of friends who played with him a couple of times and everybody was kind of debating and wondering, is, is this guy good or is this guy bad? Because he certainly was playing a new style. And, you know, back then we didn't have solvers, so anytime somebody came out with a new strategy, you had to ask yourself, okay, well, we think our strategy is right. Like, kind of the generally approved consensus of, you know, maybe we're three betting 10% and we're C betting 80% and we have all these uh, kind of like rough guidelines. We're using these bet sizings. Um, and when somebody shows up and does something much different, you don't really have proof that they're wrong. The most common opinion was that this guy was not good, but he was really high variance, kind of scary to play against. At the time, I was more of a 100, 200, 200, 400 regular. And so when he was out here battling 200, 400, and 300, 600, I was not one of the first ones to battle against him. You know, I was taking shots at 2, 4, and maybe occasionally 3, 6 when the six-handed games were really good. So I got to sit back and watch him play against other people. You know, it went from him sitting with whoever was there to, you know, him sitting at two tables with Patrick Antonius, two tables with Phil Ivey, two tables with Tom Dwan, all at the same time. And uh, it was just kind of lunacy. I just thought, you know, this guy's gonna go broke. I thought he wouldn't stick around long enough for me to play against him. So I thought he would just be out of a bankroll so fast, but he didn't go broke. He actually won millions. So he's not only battling all the best players at the highest stakes at the same time, but he was winning. It was like the trajectory that was rumored on these Euro sites just continued once he moved over to full tilt. We know Phil Ivey, we know Patrick Antonius, we know Tom Dwan, we know these guys are great. And this new kid 
Like he just can't be crushing them, right? He just can't be. Sentiment slowly shifted amongst the high stakes community from, okay, this guy's a maniac that somehow got all this money uh, and is gonna lose it to, okay, this guy knows something and he might know something we don't. At that time, game selection, we knew about it, but it wasn't treated the same way that it is today. And, you know, I would be careful about making sure I was playing in at least okay games when I was playing too high for my bankroll, frankly. But when I was playing at my comfortable stakes, I would just play whoever. After a time, I built my bankroll and I moved up to where the stakes that Islander was playing regularly were the stakes that I was playing regularly. And then, of course, we crossed paths. The first time I played Islander 1, it was a little bit scary. It felt like he was running me over. It felt like he was bluffing all the time and willing to go all in, bluffing a lot more than other opponents. So I started making looser call downs than I otherwise would. And you know, sometimes he was bluffing, sometimes he wasn't. At first, I didn't really get how he was managing to be so aggressive, but seemingly relatively balanced. Whenever you're playing somebody who puts a lot of chips into the pot, your human brain starts to think, well, when I make a hand against this guy, I'm getting a stack. So there's an element of like the gambler's mentality where against this person, you're gonna get paid off. So it's exciting to play against a person like this. It can be scary, but it's also exciting. You know, when you play against a nit, it's not so exciting. You kind of grind it out. But against someone like Isildur, you think you're gonna win a big pot, you make your hand. So I did like playing him, I liked trying. And one thing I noticed that took me a little while to notice is that he wasn't just some maniac, he was really, really smart. I like to play a style where, especially at that time, I was very tuned into what had happened recently. We talk about game flow. Recently, he's check raised three flops. So right now, if he has a big hand, he's definitely gonna check raise again. He's not gonna slow play because he thinks that I think he's check raising too much and so on and so forth. Against almost everybody that I played at this particular game, I was a step ahead. And I would usually outguess them when it came to the leveling wars. But with Isildur, it wasn't going that way. And after a time when I was wrong and wrong again and wrong again and right once and then wrong three more times, it dawned on me that no, he's doing the same thing I'm doing, but he's doing it better. When you were playing at six max tables with Isildur, it was a little bit less intimidating. It was a little bit less fast paced because you had breaks. He wasn't playing every pot. You were playing pots with other people. You could play a little bit tighter and sneak by without just being forced into huge pot after huge pot. But when you were playing him heads up, you had to play big pots. And not only that, when you play against a little one heads up, the action is always on you. My most memorable session, not just against Isildur, but against anybody, was an online session in 2009. I was in my apartment in New York. We started about 7 p.m., which was midnight for him, by the way, at 200, 400 PLO. This was not one of those swingy sessions that went back and forth. I pretty quickly started winning. And after being up around $400,000, 10 buy-ins, he wanted to move up. And so we moved up to 3.6. And at 300, 600, I continued to win until we moved up to 500, 1,000. We ended our session around 5 a.m. my time. The sun was not out yet, but soon, soon would be. And I had won $1.6 million. Uh, biggest session I've ever had uh, to this day. Most of the times when you think of seven figure scores in poker, you're winning a tournament. You're at a final table, there are cameras on you, your friends are in the crowd cheering you on, and you hold up a trophy or a bracelet and they take pictures of you. But when you do it online, you just close the lobby and you sit there looking at your computer and you smile and that's about it. You know, you stand up, you eat something and go to bed. You know, when you battle against people day in and day out, you develop a mutual respect and oftentimes a friendship. And at some point we connected 
off of Full Tilt, started chatting online. You know, quickly he, he became a friend. I still didn't know his real name. You come up playing online and make so many friends through the 2 plus 2 forums and through connecting with other mutual friends and just chatting online. You know a lot of people by screen names and you actually get to know a lot of people really well just by their screen name. A lot of the general public who followed online poker were so curious who he was and were trying to guess who he was. To me, I never cared. It, I knew who he was. He was the young online player that I played against all the time. And I knew that once I learned his name, it was gonna be a name that I hadn't heard before. So it, it just didn't matter to me. The 20 year old Swedish pro, Mr. Victor Blom. The first time I met Victor Blom was in Vegas during World Series of Poker. It wasn't at a WSOP event. I met up with him for dinner at Lemongrass at the Aria. And uh, he was this giant, smiley, friendly guy. Other than having to look up really high to talk to him, we, we got along great. During that dinner, it was the first time we had spoken. You know, we'd only typed online and, and the kind of excitement and not just his voice, but his face when talking about poker was very evident. Specifically, I remember him asking me about triple draw, which was the main game I was playing at the time. It's just seven triple draw, five card draw game where you're, you're trying to make a low hand. It's completely different from No Limit Hold'em and PLO, like not even close to similar strategy. And he just found it fascinating. He was asking me, you know, are the games good? He sees them running at high stakes. He likes to play high stakes. So I could tell that he had some curiosity about learning the game. I realized the strategy was hard to explain without a deck of cards. And so we went back to my apartment where I had a poker table and deck of cards. Um, I wasn't teaching him like how to actually be a winner at the game, um, nor was I trying to hustle him into actually playing it. Um, but I was just teaching him the basics. He was curious and he was having fun. A couple of months later, he was playing nosebleed triple draw and playing it pretty well. Triple Draw is such a technical, mathematical game, yet somehow his intuition and incredibly fast speed of thought helped him figure it out. A few years after we launched Run Month's Training, after a lot of convincing, Victor agreed to record some training videos with me. He was living in London at the time, so I flew from the US to London. I brought a couple of headsets and I was prepared to hold his hand as we made these training videos together. By this point, I knew that Victor was not a studier. I knew that he wasn't much of a strategy talker. And so I knew it was not gonna be easy for him to explain his genius in the form of a training video. Before I went, I had prepared a lot of hands that we had played together save them all, put them in Poker Tracker so that we could review them one at a time and discuss them. And I would ask him questions and he would explain what he was thinking and, and why he made the plays that he made. I got to London, we hung out, and then it came time to record the training videos. And long story short, it was just, that it was not gonna work. You know, I would ask him questions and he would have a couple words and I would try to guess like, oh, so were you thinking that I was representing a two pair type hand here, but because of earlier streets, I wouldn't have that hand. And he was just, he would just say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so it just wasn't, it wasn't going to work out. It wasn't as if I was letting him down by saying, all right, let's not do this. He didn't want to do it. He was really doing it because I, I had to push hard to convince him too. And I was really excited to do it because so many people wanted to get inside of his head. You know, he'd never talked poker strategy yet. He was this poker genius. But as it turns out, I mean, those thoughts only work inside his head. It seemed he was living a pretty fun life out there in London. He would play poker when he felt like it. And he definitely, you know, compared to me who treated poker as a bit of a job, he played it purely for fun. He just loved it. And the joy that he showed and excitement that he showed playing poker was unlike anything I'd seen. One thing I didn't know before going there is that Victor was a bit of a movie buff. He also had a really big movie collection, a lot of DVDs, um, surprising number of rom-coms. He liked to sometimes start his day by just going to the cinema and catching a 3 p.m. movie before coming back and, and starting his poker grind. 
which I I'd, I'd never done before. I mean, I guess I still haven't because I went with him. Um, but but he we went twice during that four day stay. One thing people may not know about me is that before poker, I was a bit of a gambler. I like to gamble. So I would play blackjack. Um, I would bet on sports and getting good at poker, learning the fundamentals of poker kind of beat that gamble out of me. And I thought it was gone, but staying with Victor and watching the way that he would gamble reignited that in me, which I, was not a great thing, <laughs> um, but it was really fun to watch him. I, I think at the time he had something like 150K in his account and he was playing 200, 400 and 300, 600, you know, with, with two to three buy-ins. He'd run it up to 300K. It went down to 10K, at which point he started playing 1020. Would go back up, he would move back up in stakes, go back down, he would move back down in stakes. At one point, he was down to $200. He was playing $100, heads up, sit and goes. Spun that all the way up to 25K again um, before eventually losing it all. You know, he didn't like to lose, just like none of us like to lose, but he was just loving it. Um, and to watch him in his element it was really interesting to have that kind of firsthand account of, I don't know, a level of loving gambling that I hadn't seen before uh, up close. The decisions obviously didn't look smart. However, he was having fun. He was loving it and he was loving the competition. The level of passion and excitement that he had playing $100 heads up, sit and goes two hours after he was playing 300, 600 PLO was astonishing. Despite Victor's brilliance uh, and aptitude for the game that perhaps is unmatched, his habits or lack thereof got the better of him. You know, he was playing against anybody and everybody, whoever was available and sitting at any game and he was not studying in the way his opponents were studying. And the tools were getting better and better. So the not studying was costing him more and more. And of course, most of all, he loved to be playing the highest stakes that he possibly could at any given time. It just went poorly for him. And whereas most people might step down in stakes when their downswing gets too big, Victor wasn't the type to do that until absolutely forced to. And when you're absolutely forced to, it's, it's too late. I don't know the precise details, but I know that Victor went on downswing online. He lost a lot of money live playing open face Chinese, which is not a game he knew how to play. And, um, you know, never quite recovered. I haven't stayed in close enough touch with Victor to know how he's doing. You know, we chat very rarely and, you know, it's the, the cordial, how's it going? And it's the smileys from him doing great. but. Given the love that he had for the game that I saw in his eye, I would imagine he's, he's sad about that. And I'm sad, not only for him, but just that that level of genius that he had was in a sense being wasted right now. And I, I don't mean that everybody needs to be making lots of money with their abilities. I don't mean that you have to be achieving at the highest level. I just mean that poker is a beautiful game and he has a beautiful mind for poker, especially. It's something that I loved to witness even when I was across the table from it. Will there ever be another Victor Blom? I don't think so. You know, the game is different these days. Uh, in the post solver era, raw talent is not enough anymore. Plus, there's only one Victor Blom.